everyone. It's nice to be back at DConf. So before, before starting, I just want to ask a question. Uh, is there anyone here who has never made a pull request to the compiler? Please raise your hand. OK. Uh, but are there any people who have made between one and five pull requests? OK. So the first thing I'm going to say is that there's a human resource shortage in the compiler, which I just demonstrated right now. And um, I just wanted to share my experience to all of you in hope that um, this will help future contributors accommodate more easily with the code. And also, I want to propose a list of things that we can do as a community to make it e easier for others to contribute. So uh, let's just uh, take a step back here and ask ourselves, why do people want to contribute to open source software? Of course, I haven't read any studies about this. I don't even know if there are. But I did a little research on the internet. I just Googled, why do people contribute? And even though I haven't, let's say, I haven't read a representative sample of uh, the documents which uh, talk about this subject, there are two things that come up very often. One of them is that people want to improve their skills. So contributing to open source software is a great way to, let's say, contribute to a project which is real life and which helps you develop your skills. And the other thing that came up very often is that people want to contribute that projects that matter projects that are used. Nobody wants to write code that is never used anywhere. So I can tell you from my experience that contributing to the compiler is surely going to improve your skills. Uh, you have algorithms, data structures, and a, a, a lot, a lot of cool stuff. So, and also, uh, given the fact that uh, the D language, according to the Tayobi index, is in the top 25 most used languages, it certainly has an impact if you contribute to the compiler. Still, people do not contribute. So why is that? First, uh, let's take it in general. Why would people not contribute to an open source project, not, not DMD in particular? Uh, also, I read some blog posts about this, which are literally entitled, Why do I still not contribute to open source? And most of them were saying that they don't know where to start. So let's say you want to contribute to an open source project, but it's not really clear uh, on what bugs you should work or what projects you should tackle. So not knowing and not being guided what, what to do is a, a major turnoff for most people. And the other fact was that people feel stupid when they contribute and their work is being rejected. So what we can take from here is that uh, we need to guide people on what to work on in the compiler because there are a lot of stuff that needs to be done. And also, we need to guide them to, the, to the, some projects that match their level of experience. For example, if someone does not have any experience with compilers, we must guide them to do some work which does not require that much experience. And there are projects in the compiler where you, where you can do such a thing. So uh, continuing, I just want to talk about a bit about the phases of contribution. So in my opinion, there are three phases. The first one, even if you're trying to solve a bug or try to add some new cool code, you have to find how to integrate your code with the existing code. Uh, then you have to understand what the code does, also the, the code where you want to integrate your code, and also the code you want to use, because you're probably going to use some functions from the existing project. And finally, you will write the code. Now, most programmers <coughs> will want to write code and don't like spending time in searching for the code or uh, reading a lot of code. So what we must try to do is minimize the time spent on searching the code and understanding what the code does and let programmers do what they know best, and that is actually write code. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about my first experience with DMD and how this three phases applied. So um, I first tackled the header generation issue. So basically, you had this code where you had a ref method which returned AA, and you wanted to use this command to generate the header file. Now, you would expect that the generated code would look like this. Uh, not blank. <laughs> different screen. 
Oh, maybe we should just try a reset. Reset. Sorry, P and what? Apparently, spending too much time in the compiler is also not so helpful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, you would expect this code. Now, can anyone tell me why is, oh, sorry. Why is the function body put here in the header file? Yeah. Because, without return type, because without a return type, this is an auto function. And an auto function uh, needs to have the body for the compiler to be able to deduce what time it uh, Returns. Yes, you are correct. So um, in the header files sh should be compilable decode. So if you would, if you would just generate this code, which uh, that, that was the case, um, this code is not compilable because the compiler cannot uh, deduce the return type here. So what I had to do is basically locate the code where the header generation is done and check for the return type. And if the return type was null, then uh, I had to generate the body. So sounds pretty straightforward, really simple. But take into account that that was my first encounter with DMD. So I had no idea about the organization of the code. And only the front end is spread across 163 files. So I had a pretty major issue on locating the code. So my first idea was to rgrep after minus h. This didn't lead to any results because I later found out that when the command line switch is parsed, they only check if they eliminate the minus and just see if it's an H. So I couldn't search after H because obviously that, that wouldn't have gotten me any, any answers. Then I thought maybe I should search for the entry point because then I'll see the code where the command line switches are parsed. I are grabbed after main, but still there were a lot of results, so I couldn't even identify uh, where the main function was, because it is called mars.d, actually, how I found later. So after a few hours of searching the code, I finally gave up and asked Andre, you know, where, the code, where is the code? And he, uh, he showed me that. So I started going to the next phase in understanding the code. Now, in this particular case, it was pretty easy to understand what the code was doing. But it was really hard to know what functions I had to use. Uh, I started looking at the function declaration AST class, which, in my opinion, is, is the natural thing to do. But there were a lot of fields. I didn't actually knew. Well, not, neither one was named return type or something. So I didn't know how to do. I cropped some sort of solution there, but it was obviously not the right one. And uh, I wrote it. I submitted a pull request. Of course, that broke some tests. And after a few rounds of review, someone pinpointed, actually it was Stefan who pinpointed uh, what the right solution was. And all in all, I spent like a few days on that bug, which is a pretty simple one. Most of the time I was searching for the code and trying to understand that. I literally spent like one minute writing the code, and still it was the bad solution. So after this experience, I didn't feel that I learned anything. I felt that I mostly lost time. And I was feeling pretty frustrated. I was feeling stupid. And maybe if I wasn't so committed to DMD, I would probably might have quit. So the following photo pretty much summarizes what I felt for my first contribution to DMD. So after repeating this process for another three or four times with other bugs, nothing changed. But then I finally got to work on my first project, which was DMD as a library. Now, this was my last year deconf talk, if any of you remember. So basically, I had to template the parser in order to create an isolation between the parser library and the rest of the compiler. And this, for this, I had to create AST families, create visitor classes. All in all, 
I had to do a lot of refactorization and a lot of moving of code from one point to another. There weren't so many, uh, let, I, I didn't have to write too much code. I basically had to move. But the upside for this was that, that I kind of got a good overview on the location of the code. So now I had, a, let's say, a basic idea on in which files to look in order to find the code that I needed. And also, I got to see how the AST is organized. Uh, uh, basic knowledge about the AST, so not, nothing too complicated. But then I noticed I was still doing bugs in this time. And I noticed that uh, the time spending in identifying the code got smaller and smaller. And also, the time needed to understand the code got smaller. I was still uh, pretty much losing time in understanding the code, but all in all, things were going. So I felt that I was learning something, my productivity increased, I started feeling positive emotions, like <clears throat> that I, I'm learning and things are going. So this is, this pretty much summarizes what I was starting to feel about DMD. Now, this is very important because this is what we want people to feel when they contribute to DMD. <clears throat> now, after I got let's say, a basic understanding of what the code does, I tackled my next project, which was, which was Lambda Comparison. Now, to give you a bit of context about this, I'm not going to delve into the details. We can do this online, because well, I'm pretty short on time. Um, I'm going to assume that everyone knows about the infamous Lambda string functions. There's been talk for, I think, five years of deprecating them. But the thing is that they have there is, one use, there is one case where uh, lambda string functions are actually useful, and that is for function comparison. So in Phobos, there are some algorithms which basically benefit if you know that the predicate is a certain predicate. And as you all may know, function comparison is an undecidable problem. But in this case, for these simple functions, you could actually do a string comparison and see if a function, for example, is... Uh, the equality predicate. Uh, now, what is the problem with this? Uh, this is the only way we can do function comparison. Th that was the only way we could do function comparison at that point. But it is a bit flawed because, for example, you can use only A and B. You don't have any information about the context. Um, also, if you put a space right here, then if you compare it with an equality predicate, it's going to result false, although it's basically the same code. So given all of this fact, the Lambda Comparison Project wanted to use the AST knowledge via the traits is same so that you could actually compare AST, ASTs with, let's say, uh, alpha renamed variables and so on and so forth. So this is a pretty much, uh, it, it is a very powerful uh, method and it, it kind of uh, lets room for a lot of improvement. So this is basically a whole, whole field of research. You can do a lot of stuff. You can, um, you can use context, and the, the comparison is more reliable. So basically, the, the first implementation was pretty simple. You just have to serialize the AST and compare the serialization. Um, again, we can talk more about this offline if you're interested. But where I wanted to get is that I certainly act I started writing more code in DMD. And in order to write code, I had to understand what, function, what functions it offers. So I spent a lot of time trying to understand what the functions do. And as I've put it here, I gained an advanced understanding of the AST organization. Now that you probably noticed that in the title, in the previous I had where and what, these were basically the two projects that kind of gave me the knowledge in order to go to the project that I am, I'm working on now, which is the post-bit qualifier paradox. Now, Andre talked a, a bit about this, but he didn't mention that basically the spec says you cannot qualify a post-bit. So we get from here that when the post-bit was designed, it wasn't designed to work with, with any type of qualifier. So it would basically define a post-bit and then it would be used no matter if the object is immutable, const, or shared. But in reality, the fact is that you could document, you could qualify the post blit, and it actually imposed some restrictions, which uh, later on led to undefined behavior in some situations. Not to mention that uh, 
the whole idea of having a shared pause split is kind of a philosophical question because nobody can guarantee that when you're copying uh, the data, another thread doesn't come and, and modifies the data. You, you have to lock it somehow. So, since the documentation was, was really not helpful, I had to document what the post split does going from code. But now I had the necessary tools to do that. So, um, it, it, it was a very hard, but it was a very rewarding experience because then I had to, to think about all these language design issues and what can we do to make it better. And as Andre told you, probably the solution is going to be a, a copy constructor. And what I, want, what I want you to get from this is that you can do very awesome work in the compiler, but first you have to do, let's say, less interesting projects in order to get the necessary knowledge to do that. So, in other words, this is what you feel when you get to this point. Um, okay, now, it took me like a year to get the necessary knowledge in order to, to tackle important problems. But the good thing is that we can reduce this time. And we can reduce it if, if in my opinion, so this is solely from my, uh, from my point of view, uh, we do some stuff. For example, one is that we should make a DMD source file organization diagram. Now, this would point to the users, which want with, uh, to the contributors, now where the code is. Uh, I'm not actually sure how this should look, but I'm open to ideas. My, my initial idea was that, yes? Uh, we, have a, we have a wiki page which shows an outdated um, uh, an outdated version of the organization, which is actually pretty good and which just dedicates one or two sentences to what each file is at least supposed to do. Okay, that's cool. Uh, having a wiki page is good, but having links to that wiki page on the starting as a contributor page or, I don't know, in the forums or somewhere where people would actually get to see it might also be useful. <laughs> Um, also, documenting the code. I cannot stress out how important this, this item is. And I'm not uh, talking just to document your own code. I'm also talking about documenting other people's work. For example, how I got to this point, I'm going to tell you. So, I, I've seen a code, a, a paragraph of code, which I tried to understand. It took me like half an hour, but there were like, I don't know, 20 lines of code. And everything was fine. Then, after a month, somehow I got to read the exact same, same paragraph of code, which I forgot that I, that I understood last time. And then I spent another 20 minutes or 25 minutes understanding that piece of code. And when I finally understood it, I, oh, yeah, 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 I read this code before. Now I know what it does. Then, after three months, I got to read the exact same code again still not knowing that I have read it before, and yet again losing time understanding what that code does. So the solution to this, if I had documented that piece of code when, it was when I read it the first time, I, might, I could have saved me some time. Well, what we do in DMD is we use Unix-style documentation, which is use the source, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, also improve the user specification. Andre already went through that, so I'm not going to, to lose your time on this anymore. Um, and also, this I think is, is the most important part, to create a section which uh, guides first-time contributors on what to work. So, um, let's say you're someone who just heard about the D language and doesn't know what, he, what the vision for this language is or what what projects there are in the compiler, but you want to contribute. Well, if you go on the starting as a contributor page, it just tells you uh, how to set up the repo, and then it says, oh, you can just look on, on Bugzilla. In DMD, there are about 3,000 3, bugs from which to choose. You have no idea uh, about how the code is organized, what the code does, and you're supposed to select a, a bug from that to solve. So th that doesn't work. So in my opinion, we should have there, if you're a first-time contributor, you have, we have some small projects which you have to do. If 
you think that you have knowledge about compilers and stuff like that, we have this project which you can take a look into and, and so on and so forth so that people know what to work on. And also, it would be nice to have a dev manual. In my opinion, this would be a game changer. So basically, anyone could learn about compilers uh, applied, applied on D. Because I was a master's student when I started working uh, on the D language. And in my opinion, it, it's a great language for people to learn compilers on. And it would, it would be an alternative to the Dragon Book, to the legendary Dragon Book. Well, I know that it's probably pretty hard to do a dev manual, but I think that we should have it as an idea. Um, now, I, I just put this slide here for people who want to contribute. So to have in few, a few steps what they can do. So even if you never contributed, you first have to go on the starting as a contributor and set up the repo. I'm not going to lose any time on that. And also, there's Walter's technical depth list, which you can find at this link. And there, there, there are listed some items that we need to do in order to modernize uh, the compiler code base. So at, at this moment, if you've seen the compiler code, it very much looks like C++ ported to D code. So it, it doesn't actually benefit on all the cool stuff that D has to offer. And uh, on this list, there are stuff like, uh, let's say, replacing uh, pointer parameters with ref parameters, or applying const pure no throw uh, to functions where possible, diminishing the scope of variables. I know that this might not sound very interesting, but it's necessary work, which would have a very high impact on the compiler. And also, it's a good ramp up for you if you, if you want to be a future contributor. Um, of course, after that, or if you, if you feel that you are skilled enough to, to pass this, uh, uh, let's say, this step, uh, there are the uh, bootcamp bugs, which, as you've seen, even the most trivial ones can be very complicated if you do not have the necessary knowledge. Uh, so after you kind of get used with the coast base and you know how the compiler is uh, internally represented, you can, you can tackle uh, those bootcamp bugs, which are taxed as so because they are simple. So for example, there are some bugs where you just have to modify an error message, stuff that anyone can do. And of course, you have to stay connected with the forum, which is where the, all the community energy is, where language design decisions are made, where bugs are found, and where everybody discusses. And now to wrap things up, contributing to the compiler is hard work. I'm not going to lie to you. But it is also very rewarding. And uh, I, I felt that I learned a lot during, during this past year when I worked in the compiler. And now maybe this will surprise most of you, but anyone can contribute. We do have tasks and that, that need to be addressed and that people with no experience in developing a compiler can do. And I challenge you that on Hackathon, all of you who never contributed to the compiler, pick one item on that list and make a pull request. And I will personally take care that it gets merged right away. So. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions. Fair enough. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Razan. And uh, we're going to get set up really quickly. Um, if you need to run out to the restroom or something, go ahead. Otherwise, we'll get started in just a couple minutes for the next talk. And while I'm up here, uh, don't forget that the uh, C++ meetup is tonight. And I believe it starts at 7 PM. Is that right, 7 PM? It'll be right here. So uh, once we're finished with the lightning talks, if you want to hang around for the C++ meetup, you are invited to. If not, uh, you should boogie on out of here. And you ready, Edward? Start? Yeah, we're ready Sorry. when you are. All right. All right, cool. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Edward, and I'm a master's student at Polytechnic University of Bucharest. And for the past year and a half, I've been contributing to the deprogramming language. 
my main focus was uh, writing a new collections library that takes advantage of the most important features that the D language has to offer. So, first off, safe. Safety is idiomatic to D. And I'm guessing that uh, Walter managed to convince you the, about the importance of uh, mechanical checks, right? Also, <laughs> cool. Okay, so we also want to be able to use custom allocators. What? <laughs> okay. Let's see if it's an issue with the cable or. <laughs> what the? See if it's extend worse. Okay. Hmm. What the? Okay, so hopefully it uh, helps me. <laughs> so as I was saying, safe is uh, at the core of the language. We also want to be able to use custom allocators. And what this means is that now we have to make sure that we are not exposing ourselves to double freeze or use after free, as is the case right here, right? So after we deallocate buff, uh, because we are now doing our own memory management, uh, then buff2 is not who we think uh, he is. Another important part is that we want to provide you with qualified types. Uh, currently, the existing <coughs> collections in the STD container module aren't qualified. But now we, we have this option. So yay for functional programmers. And also uh, purity. So purity is important because it allows the compiler to uh, offer us some optimizations. Or maybe you care about uh, formally checking your code, right? So now we uh, are a very close, actually. We're very close to having this. And why I'm saying it's very close, because we still have to figure out some design details about how the type system can know about no GC. And I'm going to get to that later. First off, let me take you through a journey of uh, the Im important design decisions that we have took. The most important one was to uh, rethink uh, the way we view a collection. So instead of having the usual approach, where you have the store that has like, some internal scaffolding for keeping your data, and then a range or an iterator that, that acts as a view over your data, now we're just going to have a range that has some optional primitives that enables to insert to, to the containers. Everything is self-contained. And why is this important is because it solves, just by design, the dangling range issue, for example. Now, you can just return the range, and it does its own memory management. It reference counts itself, so you won't be able to like, use something that has been uh, destroyed. A single important thing we had in mind was to come as close as possible to a built-in slice that does its own memory management. In other words, when in doubt, do what int slice does. And one thing that we get from being uh, uh, compatible with the RAGE API is that we can have seamless integration with the standard library, with algorithms that know how to use uh, ranges. So first, no GC. We said we want to provide custom allocators. An important thing to take note is that the allocator is not part of the container. And this makes uh, very much sense, because after all, a list so a list is still a list. It doesn't matter the allocator that it uses, right? So the allocator is just a means to an end. It's a way we acquire resources from the system in order to represent our data in memory. But it shouldn't define the type. 
we are going to use one of those two allocator interfaces. So RCI allocator and RCI shared allocator. Those are reference counted structures. They are currently in the experimental allocators module. <coughs> Sorry about that. And they take care of their own memory. When there is no more, when there is no more reference to one of those objects, it's just going to uh, self-destruct. Another key aspect is that if the user doesn't provide us with a custom allocator that he, uses, uh, he wants us to use, then we are going to default to a statically known allocator. The statically known allocator is going to respect the following rule. An uh, allocate and deallocate pair is not going to create garbage. And what this means is that we might find a way, a possibility, to actually use even the GC in, in the backend. This might sound controversial, but uh, just to give you like an incentive, it has to do with disabling the GC and enabling it again. Okay, safety. Uh, it should be pretty clear that we want to infer safety from the contained type, right? So just a small parenthesis here, I want you to show an uh, interesting idiom that I've uh, found, what Andre showed it to me actually. So it's the following thing, right? Uh, let's say we want to create an object of type T. We're using a custom allocator. We can put that entire code in a trusted lambda. And then what we are doing with the if zero over there is that we are going to uh, enable the type system to infer all the attributes uh, that the object, that T, has to offer. So it's going to infer if it's no GC or not, if it's safe or system, right? And it's pretty cool because this is going to be optimized away by the compiler. So we won't have any branch, we won't have any penalty at runtime. So it's, yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm using it quite a lot. Well, pop quiz question, sorry for the interrupt. Who knew about this trick? <laughs> All right. Who knows now about this trick? Everybody. <laughs> so Walter actually discovered it, and I found, I found it really cool. So if zero, it still type checks the code, doesn't run it, doesn't even produce it in the back end, but I think it's an awesome trick. Just if zero and you, you type check everything. Why not zero is shorter to type. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So as I said, we are going to guarantee safety through reference counting. So uh, how, how are we going to do this? Is we are using one of the custom allocators in the, allo in the allocators module, uh, specifically the affix allocator. And what the affix allocator does is that it's going to, aside from giving you the buffer to your, that you want to use in order to store your data, it's also going to front a small piece. And another key aspect of this small piece over here is that this is independently typed from the payload. So if Let's say we have a node from our list that's reference counted, and the node is immutable. The reference count for the node is going to be shared. Uh, we are using intrusive reference counting, as you can uh, see. So this means that it's actually uh, good for performance because we have less in indirections. A thing to take away from this slide also is that, as Timon has pointed out, this might be problem. Actually, this is problematic in pure functions, when we combine pure and safety. So this is another reason why the you know, keyword underscore underscore mutable that Andre was talking in his keynote earlier this morning uh, is, uh, is going to help us. So let's talk a bit about qualifiers. Uh, I said that now we are going to have support for constant immutable types. So allow me to show you how you would use them. So we're going to provide two primitives. First is tail. For those of you who are accustomed with functional programming, I'm pretty sure that you know what it does, right? So it's going to give us the, well, all the other elements except the head of the container. A way we could use it is we have an immutable array over here, we take the tail of it, and then we just access the front element, and it's, it's two. Another way is each. So the each primitive you can think of as a for each. It's a, it's, think, it's taking a unary function, and it applies this function over each element in your collection. A key aspect to it is that if you provide a function that, takes, that returns a flag each type, then this is capable of early stopping. So 
as I have the greater than one over here, it's going to go through each element of the immutable array and it compare it, uh, it's going to compare the result. And this is going to stop because the, exactly the first term is not greater than one. Okay, so as I uh, said about Andre's uh, talk earlier in the morning, right? So Andre was mentioning about the uh, tail qualifiers. So let's take a look at this code and see what, uh, what I mean by this. Uh, for an int of a, fun, fun is going to print at compile time int. For immutable int, it's going to print immutable int, immutable s, immutable s. But what will it print for this, for an immutable int slice? It's going actually to print a slice of immutable ints. This is the only place in the language that's, that this happens. This is a hack, as Andre mentioned in the morning, right? And, but it's proven to be a very successful hack because this allows you to use a lot of algorithms in the existing <coughs> library with immutable arrays, right? So what we want going forward is that we want to allow user-defined types to take benefit from the same advantages that the array does. And how we are planning to do so, uh, so we're planning to do a design implementation proposal. Uh, let's say we name our function op template function match. Uh, lengthy name, I know. So every time we are going to pass my range, this object my range, into a, a, templ into a template function, this guy is going to get called. And we can use introspection because we have those cool features, right? In order to decide what we want the behavior to be, depending if this is a const uh, my range or if it was an immutable my range. And for mutable types, it's safe to just return this. Just let it, let it through, right? Let, let it pass. So what this lowers to, as you can see over here, is just a call of x, as I've named it, op template function match. OK. I previously mentioned that we are going to use, uh, to use two types of allocators, and now I want to tell you why. So, immutable is implicitly convertible to shared. And what this means for us is that if we were not to use an allocator that, is, that knows how to do, deal with memory allocations in, in a shared environment, then we would expose ourselves in, to a race condition. Const is a bit more problematic because we, can, we don't know, right, if it, uh, the const reference came from an immutable object or from a mutable one. So for now, we're just going to take a more conservative approach with const as well, and we are going to require uh, the use of a shared allocator. But uh, for const, this can be relaxed later. So just to recap, we want to find a way of uh, defining a type that knows to store either a thread local or a shared allocator that we are going to use to uh, do reference counting, right? So this is going to be an affix allocator. So the first thought, the first pick was algebraic. For those of you who don't know, algebraic uh, is in the standard library, and what it does, it defines a contained type of uh, valid inputs, of valid types that you can use. Sadly, algebraic is not you know, compatible with shared. We can't use it with shared. But no problem, we're just going to write our own. While we're, right, while we're at it, at writing our own, we also need to take into account that we want to do as int slice does, right? So if you have an immutable type, you want to be able to return a mutable copy from this type. Well, what's the problem with this? Is because immutable is transitive, and the allocator is stored inside the collection, right? This is going to lock the allocator. It's going to, the immutable is going to apply to the allocator as well. So we want to find a way of storing a mutable allocator in an immutable collection. Okay, so first things first. We're just going to wrap a shared allocator and a local, uh, local allocator inside the union, and we want to reference count this as well. Now, taking it further to the next step, we also want to escape the type system, as we are doing with the reference counting. When we are reference counting an immutable object, we want to apply the same logic to allocators. We want to be able to make this guy a shared, a shared type. So that's what the union over there is all about. And I'm going to talk a bit more about its syntax later. 
So the basic flow of it would be we have the allocator is going to allocate its own support and then it's going to move itself in here. And from now on, we're using it from this, from this place in memory. So just a reminder, right, as I previously said, the allocator named allocator handler is stored inside the collection. And for when the collection is typed as either mutable, const, or immutable, we're going to have the same, uh, those types, right? So <coughs> uh, one, another aspect here is that we wanted to have something that's very specific, this allocator handler, because there are a lot of things going under the hood. We're playing with safety, with purity, with immutability, with a lot of things, so we wanted to have a lot of granularity and control over what we are doing. Okay, so I mentioned purity, so now let's talk a bit about purity. So, what is a pure function? From a high-level point of view, maybe we could define it somewhere around here, right? So, it's a function that has the same behavior for the same uh, parameters. So, it's going to give us uh, the same result for the same input. And it also it doesn't access global mutable data. So, purity is cool because, as I previously said, it helps the compiler uh, optimize our code for us, or we can do static checks. But what about purity and allocators? Where from the type system's point of view, an allocator <coughs> sorry, is impure because it accesses global state. But from a logical point of view, an allocator is just a way of accessing system resources. So, uh, and it's safe to assume, right, that if we have enough memory, then the system is just going to provide us with another fresh copy and when we have run out of memory, then we already have some big problems there, right? So just throwing an out of memory error or returning a null pointer, but it still sticks in the, inside the guidelines of purity. So what this means is that we need to have the allocator functions, allocate, deallocate, expand, all of them, they need to be pure. And in case you did not know, the GC already does this. What's the difference between the GC and all the other allocators in the experimental module? Magic, exactly. <laughs> so it's magic. The type system knows about the GC and he gets preferential treatment, but it shouldn't. Okay, so the next topic, immutable collections are purity are really tricky. Just to recap, we're now going to have an immutable allocator handler. And we want to make sure that the compiler won't optimize away our calls. It's not going to say like, hey, this is immutable, it's not going to change anything, so it's safely, I can safely just not call this function, right? So it would be problematic for memory allocations, it would be problematic for deallocating. So coming back to this guy over here, I'm just going to go really quick because it's a, a lot of implementation detail. First off, disclaimer, this is a hack. So, <laughs> The point of this hack is to try and escape the type system, and currently it works. So what we want to do here is, remember that I said we are moving the allocator in, inside the support? Well, well, now with this pointer, what we want to do is just like store the address. And the, the address there is not mutable, it is immutable. But the object of that address we don't know nothing about. So currently this works, but it, it, must, it doesn't necessarily need to work. It, it doesn't have guarantees. So, First, first thought to take away from here is that we need to improve the specification of pure and what purity does and what the compiler can do with purity. And this comes again as a reinforcement for mutable, which is a way to stop the immutable transitivity. And part of the reason why we came to the conclusion that, that, that we need this is because we hit so many problems while trying to implement collections. So currently, we have four working uh, examples of collections in the form of a singly linked list, a doubly linked list, an array and a hash table, and a reference counted string is uh, under development. So what this guy is going to do is going to manage his own memory and is not going to do auto decoding. He's going to decode the string only when we ask him to do this. So I hope you all, I don't know, find this pleasable, right? Or cool. <laughs> so, The, uh, the library is available as a dub package. The code is on GitHub, and you can find the documentation over here. Let's see if uh, this won't break, and I can use an alt tab. No, I didn't want to play nice. 
duplicate. Cool. Yeah. So documentation is stored with the GitHub pages. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'm here to answer your questions. Uh, so I have a question. Uh, do you consider uh, a pender to be part of the collections, and will that be included as well? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the start? Uh, the, uh, it's a array appender, so it's not part of the collection set, but uh, do you consider that to be logically part of the collections, and will that be added as well? So I haven't looked at the appender implementation, so I don't uh, know how this would uh, work with it, but probably if we can find a way of making them work together, then we'll probably provide a, a separate implementation inside the collections module. Yeah, so you had the, I um, <coughs> can't remember the name of it, it was humongous op change template parameter or something like that. Okay. Um, that does work, and it actually has some good uses beside from just figuring out const, uh, but I wonder if you'd considered a function with, that's not a template that takes a, let's say a const range, and you want to pass it just a range if there's any way we can solve that problem as well. Because if you want to basically specify this function won't modify any data in the range. So uh, maybe Andre might want to take this one. <laughs> Embarrassment of riches. So uh, it's a simple lowering. We're, we're simply looking at the lowering here. And uh, you get to the, the example was, um, was generic because it was simplest to implement on one slide and very evocative, but it's just, uh, it, you know, whenever you match the, the parameter, you go into the lowering, and the user does whatever the heck they want with the lowering, template, non-template, what, what have you. Um, the details are to be, uh, to be established, but essentially we're going with uh, sure winners, which are lowering to existing decode, the simpler, right? Uh, and um, and doing what uh, what the, what the compiler already does for built-in arrays, which has been like immensely useful uh, in the sense that everybody was silently happy. It was like a headache that went away. Right. Yeah. So the compiler already also does a conversion from uh, const a const array to a const array slice. Even when it's not a template, is this, this just the other, um, the other possibility that does it? Yeah. Um, if collections are ranges, how do they not get consumed when you pass them to a function that takes a range? So, well, well the, the post bit is just going to create a copy, like a shallow copy, right? So you're just, you're just going to have another reference to, let's say, the start of the list, and you're, so you're you're just like consuming that that uh, second copy of it. So, so it, it basically calls dot save for you when you pass yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Postbit does that for you. Okay. Or, yeah. Or when we'll switch to copy constructor, that is going to do that for you. Um, are there other examples of where you need to store a mutable uh, allocator in an immutable array? Because like I found the dupe example fairly bad. Because like basically maybe you do caller of dupe would want to pass his own allocator for the duplicate, like he wants to make a copy and then he passes the allocator rather than storing it inside the error. So are there other examples where you need it? So, so you, also, you also need it for the, for the reference count, right? So uh, when, you, uh, when the time comes to like free, free the objects. So for freeing, yeah. For okay. freeing as well, I mean you, you also need that, right? Yeah, but that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's already in memory, the reference count. Yeah, that's the mutable part, yeah. The D language already supports arrays, just use the uh, square brackets, and it also supports associative arrays. So what are the advantages of the new collections library except the possibility to use custom allocators? So... Uh, First off, support for uh, built-in keywords in the language. 
So now the type system can infer purity and safety and all of those. Uh, another one is uh, uh, qualified types, so constant immutable types, uh, which are, you, you don't, you're not able to go build, construct a const uh, array from SD container. Was the question, what's the advantage over built-in uh, built construct slices? Pardon? Was that the question, what's the advantage of user-defined collections over built-in slices? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you can add no GC. That's it. Okay. So Slices work with everything except GC, no GC. And now you can use everything plus no GC. It's like if we get to the point where we have a slice that takes care of its own memory, we're there. That's really it. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I missed Okay, I think uh, we're, we're over our lot of time. Um, so I think we're going to have to cut the questions there. If you have more, I, I'm sure Andre and Edward will both be available after. Uh, we want to be back here by 5.40 to start the lightning talk, so it'll give us a little bit of cushion if we go over time. And so uh, thank you very much, Edward. Thank you. Lightning talk people, I need you up front, please.